Hockey fans, another day and another day of talking hockey here for the Dan K Show. NCDC this week, presented by the Dan K Show, is live now on Instagram or after the fact, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast that's Spotify, iTunes, and anywhere in between, it is hockey time here in the Dan K Show studios. Now On Frere from another mayor, Lucas Jones, joining us and jumping into the group here from our NCDC JR Hockey page that if you aren't following, you best be following. What's up, man? What an embarrassment. We're both wearing matching hats. Well, we're both wearing matching hats. We we should have planned this better. But I tell you what, the hats are so darn comfortable, Dan, and they fit my head, which is even better. So I'm living the dream over here. Living the dream and we are living the dream in ncdc hockey folks we are now three weeks into the 2023 2024 campaign and this tier two tuition free hockey thing is going pretty well around the country especially out west right now lucas how about this mountain division how about these sold out crowds how about the up and down battles and some fun names in net right now. It's where we start our two leading net miners in terms of goal against average. Michael Polston, who's on the Polston. You know, it's like it's like on the pole in NASCAR. This, this guy has been stellar. And this name will sound familiar, and it sounds so for a reason. Vladislav Berzgalov. Berzgalov the Briz. Briz Jr. right here, 1.71, a 947 saves percentage. Polston, a 147 with a 952. Provo with Polston. Ogden with Berzgalov. These two are stellar. Yeah, and I think it's one of the reasons, Dan, why these two teams have had the success that they've had, right? So you have a goalie for Ogden, a goalie for Provo, who sit at the top of these goaltender rankings here. And then you have Ogden at 12 points in Provo at 11, yeah. right? Provo Predators handed their first loss this past first week. First just logged loss. in, by the way. We're talking about him right now, and Vladdy just logged in. Vladdy, a little 2-0 and 1-1 and start to the season, a 171 and a 947. But keep going, Lucas. Sorry to cut you off. That, you know, you say his name three times, he shows up, and he starts stopping talks. I think that's <laughs> how it works. But, I mean, you, you have the two best goalies in the league, and you have the two best teams right now in the mountain, right? So the Ogden Mustangs with 12 points through eight games, the Provo Predators 11 points through six games, handed their first loss, a shootout loss by Utah. So, you know, it's uh, you don't really look at those shootout losses too heavily. But what I'm seeing, Dan, is a really competitive mountain. And, you know, we thought that the mountain division was going to have – just be this wild goal scoring affair, right? That these these scores were going to be huge, you know, with all the the shooting talent out there. But you look at some of these netminders and you look at some of these goal differentials. Ogden and Provo, they've got single digit differentials. This is some really close hockey being played in the map. We saw it last year throughout the entire NCDC in the what was the North and South divisions, right? Now the New England and the Atlantic divisions. You saw that net minding was really kind of the go-to. Like there's linebacker use in football. The NCDC really seems to be kind of finding a niche as net minder you. <clears throat> and you look at you look at the goal differentials in every single division. Even the lowest of the low, the guys that have started off the season slow, not sitting in a bad spot. Like Connecticut in last place right now in the Atlantic Division, a minus four goal differential, right? Like these these aren't runaway shootout games. These are not just guys running away with it. You look at Rock Springs looking for their first win as an organization out there on the mountain in their first ever season. A minus 19, like they, these aren't runaway games. They're still low scoring. They're still hard fought. And it's it's what you're looking for at this NCDC level. It's what this brand's trying to be. It's fast hockey, but it's correct hockey, right? It's trying to build the brand that the NCAA wants to recruit. The NCAA, when you look, I always talk to guys at that level. And the big thing they talk, talk about is, you're not always you're not looking for the guys that can put up seven a night. You know what I mean? That's not the style of hockey they're going to have to play when they get to the NCAA level. You're going to have to grind it out. You're going to play close games, and you're going to need to start from the net mouth out building a team. And you can do so in droves in this league. You start with Paulston. You talk about Berzgala. Flatty's in the comments saying could be better. All right, whatever you say. Nine four seven. I'll settle with a nine four seven eight every day. But you love that mentality. That's a winner's mentality, right? You, you don't want to settle. You can't settle in October. October is is where you get better. November, December, January, you're developing throughout. And then you get the cup chasing season when you get into January. That's when we start thinking about winning cups and we put the stats aside. 
Braden McIntosh right now. It's tough to get an apple when McIntosh is in net. Can't find assists with this guy in there. 3-1-0. He's got a 178 and 947. Frank Murph. Murphy, baby. This guy last year was the best netminder in the premier, according to Dan K. Could be one of the top fives, if not the top one by the end of the year in the NCDC. He's 5-0, 1-0, That's how we get to IHC. Let's talk about the Islanders Hockey Club, Lucas. This is probably the hottest team in the NCDC right now. The last couple of years, Timmy K, Coach Kirk Costas, has been battling, has been scraping and clawing to figure this thing out and get them back to their winning ways. IHC might be back at the top of things in the New England. Yeah. You know, we talk so much, Dan, about the South Shore Kings and the PAL Junior Islanders, right? This, like, this rematch where, you know, PAL on the top of their division and the South Shore Kings looking like they were on a vengeance tour. And then IHC, you look again, and they've got 18 points through 10 games. Yep. They've got a plus 20 goal differential, right? They're locking down other teams. And this IHC squad, which has been sitting kind of middle of the pack the last couple of years, has absolutely launched themselves through the early going in the NCDC. you got to imagine a lot of it is based off of what Frank Murphy is doing on the, the net minding end, right? You talk about him, a 945 save percentage, third highest shots against in the NCDC right now behind Nick Bevilacqua for PAL and Wilmer Brunden for CJR. So he's facing a ton of shots, making a ton of saves. It's just really hard to put anything past the net minders right now for IHC, and that helps the offense out on the other end. Get more. Yeah, and then he you look at a, a veteran in Max Lundgren, who's currently on the longest goal-scoring streak in the league. He's got it six games in a row. He's gotten a goal. He's got eight in his last six, 10 total points in his last six. This is going to be a dangerous team. You know, this is a squad that right now, they, they've got another guy on, a, on, a, on an assist streak here with two games in a row. You know, this is this is a team right now you're going to have to watch out for at the top of the New England division. I got dogs fighting behind me right now. I don't know what's going on in the streets of Palm Harbor, Florida right now. We get dog battles happening. But I'll tell you what, this is going to be a difficult team to deal with. And you look in that division, it's going to be a battle of titans between them and the defending runners-up, the South Shore Kings, who their game against PAL just a week and a half ago at the Ice Vault Arena at the Hitmen Classic, just two weeks ago, a week and a half, whatever the numbers are, that was probably the most impressive regular season performance I've ever seen in an NCDC game. They're 8-1-1. One, and one. They're just a point behind IHC. And they've got a guy in an assist, an assist streak, now second overall in the league in points, in Kotaro Marase. Yeah, and that's... It's going to be someone that they, they rely on quite heavily, right? And we talk about that game that was at the, the Jersey Hitmen Showcase. South Shore Kings putting up 34 shots in the second period of play. 34 shots in a single period, out shooting PAL Junior Islanders by 40. And doing all that while, you know, taking a bunch of penalties along the way. You know, five penalties taken for each side. So I think this, I think this South Shore team is certainly a team that, that has an ability to just be an avalanche. but. I think, Dan, the reason those dogs might be barking right outside your window is because they know that this division, this New England division, is a bit of a dogfight right now, especially right at the top. Wow. Because right underneath the – you know what? I know what I'm doing. I got your back, man. This is – I got you locked in. The New England division, IHC, South Shore Kings, separated by one point. But just under them, Dan, the Junior Bruins right now, through 10 games, 14 points, they're playing really close hockey. They've got a goal differential of six. And the re one thing I really like for IHC and the Junior Bruins right now is they're doing it all with very low penalty minutes. I always like looking at the penalty minutes of these top teams to try to get a handle on you know, what, what that could mean in the long run, right? Because as these penalty units and these power play units get settled in across the league, you're going to start seeing those numbers tick up a little bit. And if you keep taking a ton of penalties, that could work against you. So for the Junior Bruins right now as well, sitting in third place with only 74 penalty minutes, the second lowest in that division, I like the Junior Bruins as a team that that is a grinding team, right? They don't score a ton, but they don't give up a ton of goals. They play a full 60. And I like the way this New England division is shaping up here. Yeah, and to add to the list of teams to be worried about, Lucas an 0-6 start for the first time in the history of one of the most storied franchises in all of junior hockey. An 0-6 start. But oh no, in their last four, 
four victories for the Jersey Hitmen, storming back a four-game winning streak, a big win over Wilkes. Uh, where are we at with the Jersey Hitmen? Are you buying or are we selling on the boys from Wayne, New Jersey? Well, I, I'm not going to sell on the Hitmen. I, that that much is, is certain. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and say that four games in a row against starting with a win against the Junior Bruins, like we've talked about, getting a little revenge against the Rockets Hockey Club, right, who who had a, a good start I get, to their season against the Jersey Hitmen. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that the Jersey Hitmen aren't for real. What I am going to sit here and tell you is that the biggest difference for me, Dan, is that the defense is showing up for the Jersey Hitmen. And I think the defense has been inconsistent, right? So you look at just their October, a 2-1 loss against the Twin City Thunder. Defense shows up. You only give up two goals. That's great. Offense wasn't there. Then you give up five against IHC, right? You go back to, to their September as well, and you're seeing some inconsistencies, giving up five, giving up four, right? So it seems like the number for the Jersey Hitmen, if their defense is, is firing through and they're only giving up about three goals a game, that's a pretty good number. Now you're relying on your offense to put some pucks in the back of the net. I have to wait for their October to finish out before I start buying on the the Jersey Hitmen resurgence here. They've got a tough schedule, two games against the Connecticut Junior Rangers, two games against the Mercer Chiefs to close out the month. If I can see some some more wins, some more four or five goal performances out of their offense, some more two goals given up performances out of their defense, then I could pretty confidently say that I'm buying that the Jersey Hitmen are past the speed bumps and they're ready to go. Yeah, and you look at the top right now, they got a climate team in the Rockets Hockey Club that swept them to kick off this season, lost to them since. A PAL Junior Islanders team that raised the cup last season with big guys like Heike Vertanen back and Dino Mineta and the rest of the crew and adding in some help at net. You look at a team like the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Knights who they just were able to take two from that. There's a bit of a log jam. It feels like PAL is the clear one right now in that division, which tells you a lot about South Shore and the New England after that dominating victory in Jersey. Then you feel like the Rockets have kind of a leg up but Jersey, Mercer, Wilkes, Connecticut, anybody's ball game. I can tell you what, Jim Henkel's sitting at the bottom of the pack right now with six points on the season, three and six on the year. He ain't going to settle for six. That team's going to be battling the rest of the way through. Let's head back out to the mountain here, Lucas. I want to head back out to the mountain, and I want to talk about another resurgence, a team that also got off to an uncharacteristically slow start, the Utah Outliers, now sitting in third place, 10 points on the year for the Outliers, just two points out of a first-place spot behind Ogden, one point behind a Provo team that's got two games in hand on them still, but 5-3-0 and after starting the year 0-2 and in a sweep on the road to the Pueblo Bulls. They've won five of their last six. Utah, do we buy the Outliers or are we selling? I think this is a team that, that I'm a little bit more confident buying right now um, you look at their last couple of games, and and I think all season they've had the same look to them. They have had this full 60, grinded out, willing to go the distance mentality. The one thing that they're now figuring out is consistently managing the game. I think that's the biggest thing here, right? Because you look at their first two games against Pueblo, they gave up 12 goals in two games. It's a little uncharacteristic for Utah, right? I don't mind that Utah's scoring somewhere between three, four goals a game right now, but I think their consistency and their ability to control the puck in the neutral zone by their own blue line, these are things that, you know, you're sort of starting to see a little bit more here, that this team is doing more successfully. I think their shootout win against the Provo Predators is the indicator for me. I went back and watched that game. And, you know, I, I just feel like this is a Utah team that I'm pretty comfortable buying at this point, that that start, you call it uncharacteristic. I'm willing to agree with you on that. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at Utah, you look at Coach Paul Taylor and the squad there, Kevin McCloskey behind the scenes working to, to kind of tinker and put this roster together all offseason long. You, you got guys like Sagadiev with five points on the year, but David Ukin's been the guy. Eight games played on the season he's got nine goals he's got two assists the league the team leader in points with 11 on the year six more than anybody else in that locker room right now playing so well lucas he's about to get an ultimate team card i've been working on it right now behind the scenes those are going to be dropping in in a day or two here ncdc premier elite ultimate cards and this is a guy in david ukin who's leading the way 
nine goals, two assists. This is a goal scorer. It's only taken four penalty minutes in eight games. It's a physical group out there. You talk about Lucas Wiet, the one goal, three assists, four points for this outlier side as an 03. Garrett Joss, this is just a team that they can get a lot of things done. Set a pain that's grace in the forward with four points, two and two. Watch out for this Utah team. As they get hot, this, there's just something about kind of the setup there in Utah. You feel like the winds will start to roll through. Griffin Davis getting hot in net right now, 3-0 and on the season, a 9-1-7. Just, it's this Utah team not one to fall asleep on. Another team not to fall asleep on is our main man, the Pueblo Bulls. These guys out rolling with the Bulls right now. They started the year 2-0. and against this Utah team, been a bit more of a slide since. They go 0-4 the next four, two-game winning streak. Now the ups and downs of the Pueblo Bulls, Lucas. Which way are they going? They trend it up or down in your mind? Well, I, I feel like I feel like for Pueblo, it's it's been a little bit back and forth, like you said. And and I do want to make one more point on Utah here. You mentioned we had. What? Well, I'll allow it. He, he, just one more point on him is Utah, you're, you're buying on a team like Utah, and you haven't seen the production from Wyatt in just the last couple of games. So you feel like he's due. And when he starts firing again, imagine what this Utah team will do. But as far as Pueblo here, Dan, I, I think this is a team that is not trending downward, right? I, I know that they're a bit streaky, and they've shown that through the start of the season here. But I buy that that hometown crowd makes it a problem when teams come to visit them. They can rely on that. I love the production that I'm seeing from their defensive unit especially in terms of goals and assists. Normally you talk about defensemen, you're only talking about assists, but you're seeing a lot of production from the blue line, and you're seeing production from from a lot of 0-4s here, right? That's the big thing, too. So I think for Pueblo, the streakiness is part of the beginning of the season, right? Every coach tells us, you know, we're, we're figuring some stuff out, we're working on it, right? But I feel like the streaks mean that they build on momentum, and you just got to get rid of those slides, right? If you have if you have one bad game, you got to move past it. That's the big thing mentally that this team will get and if they get that, they're going to continue to trend up. Here's my worry about Pueblo and this is why I would be on the side if you asked me to point an arrow up or down, I'd be pointing it kind of kind of like sideways directionally down right now compared to some of their opponents that they're dealing with, the Utahs of the world, the Provos of the world, the Ogdens of the world. Utah, Ogden, Provo, all right now feel like they've got a clear number one that they're relying on, right? Especially Polston and Provo, especially Berzgalov out there in Ogden. When you look at those guys, you say, I'll, I'll, I'll go to bat with those guys, right? What you're trying to find right now, you've got three net miners that are battling to be the number one in Mitchell, Volsky, and Dempsey. Who's going to be that guy, right? Those saves percentages right now ticking in that 900 and below range, you're looking to stop shots, and the way that this game opens up on a lot of these Olympic sheets out there in the mountain, the way these guys can skate, the speed that's on the ice, the size at this Tier 2 level, and then you add in the fact that you're competing against teams that any given night can throw a world beater in the net. They can throw a guy who can stop everything no matter what you do and stand on their head. You need to match that net minding with your own, and if you don't on a day-in and day-out basis at this level – you're going to struggle. It's going to come down to the net for me in Pueblo. If you see those young guys step up, if you see somebody take over that room, see Braden McIntosh logging in right now watching this thing. We just talked to him. He took over the room in Jersey, right? He takes over the goaltending room in Jersey, he takes the helm. When you see that clear cut number one, all of a sudden 0 and 6 Hitmen team is 4 and 6, right? All of a sudden they're rolling off four straight. All of a sudden they can't lose right now because a net miner took over. That's what you need in the room in Pueblo. If you're going to find a way above this 500 mark and you're not going to ebb and flow all season long, it's going to take someone putting up a good week, a good month, a good year. Who's going to be the guy? Who's going to step up in that locker room? Who's going to be the one to take the helm? That's that's the big goal right now in Pueblo. And we talked about big goals. Let's go to the Idaho Falls Spud Kings, one of the biggest crowds in all of junior hockey. This place is an absolute beauty. We can't wait to get out there in December. We're going to be doing some fun stuff in Idaho Falls. They're 3-3-1-0 three, three, oh right now. They've lost their last two, got one point in their last two games, plus three goal differential, not a high-scoring team, not a team that's going to run you out of a rink. They had a six-foot, three-inch tall defenseman be a trade. Where are we at with Idaho Falls? Where do we sit right now with the Kings of Potato Valley? Well, I think for, for Idaho, 
Idaho Falls, you're you're seeing the same thing consistently, which is good defense. I mean, you look at you look at their last couple of games, right? They they gave up one goal to Rock Springs, three goals to Ogden, three goals to Provo. Now both of those were losses, but when you talk about how many goals a game that Provo and Ogden are giving up, where we talked about our kind of our clear cut number ones, they're giving up about two or two and a half, right? So when you look at an Idaho Falls team that their worst defensive output was giving up seven and two games against Rock Springs. I just think it's an offensive issue for them. And maybe that's why they're, you know, they're adding a little size. Yes, it's on the defensive end, but we know what creates offense, right? And it's good defensive play. It's puck control through center ice. And if you're finding yourself in a position where, hey, we don't feel like we're scoring a ton of goals or we want to be scoring more, throw a little size in front. I'll always talk on the air, Dan, about how when a team's not scoring, you got to put the puck in front of net and go battle for it. Dump the puck in and go battle for it. Wear down the team, create space in front. So I think if Idaho Falls can find that consistency on the offensive side, it'll mesh up well with the defensive end. But I will say that I feel like finding offense a lot harder in tier two hockey than finding defense. Yeah. And and you look at it, this is a Marty Quarters team, though, the way it's built. Like, it's built from the net out, and then the blue line's going to get involved in scoring. And that's going to be kind of where the game gets held up. The game's going to get held up from up top. You're going to flash skaters in front. You're going to try to make plays. It's kind of similar to what Coach Kersner does with the Rockets, but almost a little little more of a slower style of that brand, where Coach Kersner will take a little more chances. He'll kind of Mike McDaniels you a little bit with a little razzle-dazzle. The Idaho Falls Flood Kings are going to make plays from the blue line. They're going to look for that to create. They're going to look for rebound chances. One guy I love in this roster is George Goodwin right now, a leading point getter. He's a forward that can get involved a little bit more on the goal side of things. Jack O'Rourke is a guy you can trust a bit. Milan Tadeus Jobeck. Like, these are guys that can do a little bit extra. I love what DJ McLeish gives you. Yo, DJ, that's my DJ McLeish. We're going back to an old DJ Randall quote from the Hampton Roads Whalers day, but DJ McLeish, man, this guy's spinning the greatest hits, and a lot of them are great passes and some hard-hitting defense. He can do it on both ends. He was an ultimate team member last week. A real, real fun watch if you get a chance to take in some DJ McLeish hockey. At the bottom end here, Lucas, the Rock Springs Grizzlies trying to battle back up in this mountain division right now, looking for their first win. I mean, it's – your first season, right? Your first draft, your first chance putting this all together. This is a great leadership group that knows how to win hockey games behind the scenes in Rock Springs. They got a guy in Dawson Madden who's been real good a year 2005, Peyton Smith. This is a super duper young team. This is this is one of the youngest teams on the planet at this tier two level. And really, they're kind of dealing with and a little bit more of an increase in the same troubles that Pueblo's having, right? Finding that number one in net right now. They're trying to find the guy who's going to be the guy to put the mask on each and every night. And I think they've got the tools to do it. It just takes time here at this level of game. Yeah, that's the biggest thing, right? I mean, you can look at Rock Springs and you can you can see, right? They're they're just they're giving up too many goals, but. It's still early in the season, right? The NCDC season, don't forget, is longer this year, right? You've got an extra month of games that are being added. So I think for Rock Springs, you're going to find that first one, and then they get a little easier from there, right? We saw last season that Idaho Falls struggled out of the gate. They were a first-year team last year in the USPHL premiere. They struggled out of the gate. They made some adjustments. They started winning a ton of hockey games. They even cracked the Dan K Show top 20 at one point. So I think that, you know, you just have to keep playing the game, keep making the adjustments. For Rock Springs, you have a good staff that's there. You have supportive ownership group. And, you know, for the Mountain Division, I think it's a strong division as well. So you've got a first-year team, and with a strong division, it'll create some problems out of the gate. But for Rock Springs, like we said, just keep grinding, and that those wins will come. Yeah, and now, now we take a look at the bottom half of this New England division. You look at Utica, you look at Twin City, you look at the Northern Cyclones right now, rounding out the last couple teams we haven't had a chance to talk about. Utica, a team that got off to a 3-0 start, dominating performance in the Junior Bruins shootout, right? They, they come out of the gates fast. They've started to struggle of late. The Twin City Thunder, team led by Dan Hodge, not the start they want this year, right? A guy who's a defensive-minded guy, just not getting the goal scoring out, but you talk about Northern as well. Coach Bill Flanagan has said it to us in person this year. He's got one of, if not the youngest squads he's ever coached at this level of a game, and that's what you're seeing right now. As this game trends younger in this NCDC Tier 2, you're going to have those ebbs and flows. You're going to have those ups and downs, and Lucas, all three of these squads dealing with it right now. 
Yeah, they certainly are. And for the Northern Cyclones, you know, I think you what you do is you look at the Boston Junior Bruins from last season, right? A team that was really one of the first squads to go as young as they went, right? And and have a lot of a lot of these younger skaters and they struggled, right? So the young skaters are learning the game, but this is where the development comes in, right? The junior Bruins right now a team that's doing doing well, right? And for the Northern Cyclones, you know, you don't have any questions about their ability to develop skaters, forwards, defensemen, goalies, you name it. So I think for Northern, you, you'll you see that go. And, you know, Twin City has put together some good performances. I, I like that they took the Islanders Hockey Club to OT. They're beating out the Utica Junior Comets. They had a good win against the Hitmen a little bit earlier this month. So, you know, I think these teams here, you talk about the bottom teams, and, and yes, statistically they're at the bottom, but you look at a team like Utica Junior Comets, you see them with nine points, and I just think it's too early to start hitting the panic alarm on any of these squads. You, you really need to give it another month here because we've seen these teams in person, we've watched them on flow hockey, and, and you just got to be you got to be hopeful that these incredible coaching staffs are going to be able to develop and put some more wins on the table. Well, now that that, that run on sentence is over, I can finally get to Jim Hankel, who's been screaming at me in the comments, just saw that. trying to get in. Let's see. Let's see if we can let him in here real quick. We get hit the little accept button here. Let's see if we we haven't tried three yet. We've only ever done two. We'll oh see. boy. Got a, oh boy. Oh, he's in a tiny picture. We're getting yelled at by Coach. Coach, it would not be a Dan K show live if you did not show up. This time you're not driving though. That's a plus. No, I'm safely uh, sitting at home uh, at my kitchen table, uh, and I have fully hit the panic button. You've already hit. Panic. That's what I'm wondering. I'm, I was wondering where you're at right now. We're sitting here yeah. talking through that division right now. You look at that Jersey Hitman team. I'm sure, look, nobody's Schadenfreude, and no one's rooting for Schadenfreude, right? That word for the folks at home who don't know it, it's a German word that means joy in the misery of others. But I'm sure, as a guy who's had to deal with Toby Harris and the Jersey Hitman and how good they've been for so many years, there was a little Schadenfreude when you look at them start 0 6. Now they roll off four straight. That, that I got to. It's got you wanting to hit that gas pedal a bit right now to catch up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we got to get out of neutral before we start hitting the gas pedal. I mean, we're, we're, we're coasting along in neutral right now. Um, and, and again, you know, to, to have them start the way they did was a complete shock. Where they're at right now is not a shock. Um, you know, I, I know the work that goes in on, from that staff. Um, and I, I, it, it doesn't shock me one bit. I mean, they're going to continue to grow and get better. Um, you know, we've, uh, again, like I said, we've got to get out of neutral. We're, we're kind of stuck in the mud right now, just spinning, spinning the wheels a little bit. We take uh, a step and a half forward, and it's two steps back. Um, we do some good things, and then you got to revisit some things that we touched on previously. Um but to sit there and say that no coach is in panic mode right now is is it couldn't be further from the truth. We're we're all uh, scrambling for answers, looking for uh, things that can get together and get our teams on the right track. Uh, points now are extremely important um, as you generate, you know, into Thanksgiving and then Christmas. Uh, you'll be going back, going. I wish we had that extra point when we had that tie and we lost it late. Uh, we know firsthand from last year how many games that we had uh, either tied or we lost in overtime that we had a lead. Um, that cost us, right? Like we look back on it, we had Mercer down four nothing in their building. Uh, we lost that game in overtime, uh, and that's the difference between us being in the playoffs and not. We win that game in regulation. Um, we need to just tie that game late in the season. Um, but I can go through probably 19, 20 points last year that we lost either in overtime or late in the games that we were tied going into overtime and, you know, kind of shot ourselves in the foot and gave up a goal late. So uh, every point is utterly important. Uh, we know that. I know that personally as a staff being the, on the outside looking in the last two years. Um, but, again, there's no easy road, right? There's, there's, no, there's no let up from here. you got the Hitmen and then Wilkes. Um, you know, and then it's all division until you get to February. So, and everything's a, a two game set. So it's going to be a grind. You can go from sixth to third in a weekend, or you can go from first to fourth in a weekend. Um, and that's kind of where it's at now with the way we play, you know, these division games and they're always back to back. So another team does well and you struggle, you're going to get leapfrog and then vice versa. You do well and somebody else struggles. You can, you can move up pretty quickly. So.
Yeah, and we talk about it. This uh, last season, it came down to the wire. There's still, I can't say the full Louis Echicate quote accidentally live into a microphone on the air, but we have heard him quote, my gosh, uh, to, to translate, these are two very important points today as he was battling for a player spot that they didn't get a few years back. It's These, these divisions are going to be close the whole way through. And we were talking about it before you get on here, Coach, just about – it feels almost like the NCDC is getting into this like goaltender U type development system. There's so much net minding uh, at a high level right now. It's tough to score the puck. You're looking at goal differentials. I mean, you you guys are a minus four and you're three and six, right? It's like you're not playing games. You're not getting run out of barns each and every day. These games are close. What what does it feel like on ground level on the bench right now playing in this league? Got Frank Murphy in the net for Skaloff out west. Like these net minders we're getting a chance to see every day. Um, yeah, I mean, like I, I think a lot of individual performances by goaltenders have been fantastic this year. Um, and then I think it becomes a situation where you have you know, players on your team, you know, fighting to keep pucks out of the net, um, you know, on behalf of the goaltender, right? Like they've gone out of their way to make saves, to bail you out. And if you have a chance to repay them, you, you see some guys do it. I mean, I saw some of our guys literally diving in front of pucks, uh, after our goaltender made two or three saves with a wide open net this past weekend versus Powell, uh, just to keep us in a one goal game. Um, and again, sacrificing to, to keep your team in, in, in a situation where you can battle. But there are some great goaltenders. Um, I think you missed one there in Utica, uh, Mr. Esch, uh, who's been fantastic. This is year two for him, uh, 2005. So a younger kid playing last year, and we saw what he can do firsthand against us. Um, and you'll see some really good things come out of him as well. Um, we're, we're working on that aspect as we speak. So we, we've had some up and down performances in, in the net. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to do a better job in our systems to alleviate the extra uh, opportunities we're giving up. We're sacrificing way too much ice time and giving up way too many shots. Uh, I think we've been outshot almost every game. Uh, which leads to a lot of failures. Uh, so not, uh, not, not great on our behalf, but, um, you know, goaltending is always going to be a huge factor, right? And if you, yeah. if you can figure that out and you have a, a solid one with a great number two that can uh, give that number one a little bit of a, a breather from time to time, um, you know, you saw last year with Powell. They, they ran a goaltender from basically wire to wire um and and games played last year um so just kind of an idea of, of what goaltending can do for you guy jack hauser who you want to talk about a little bit of development right this is a guy who last season in 42 games played at 17 points now he's got 12 assists already on the year he's already got 15 and nine games played and only eight penalty minutes, right? He's staying out of the box a little more than he did last year. He had some penalty woes, we know. You look at power play goals, he's getting involved there. Talk to me about the roster this year. Who are some of those guys? And what do you feel about a guy like Jack? Um, I think Jack did some really good things over the summer as far as uh, conditioning and off-ice work. Uh, I also think he uh, understands what it takes to be successful at this level. you got to understand last year he came in from Belmont Hill. Uh, prep school, very, very challenging academically, uh, but also uh, a situation where, um, you know, those kids are playing at a very high level when you talk about Belmont Hill and how successful they've been for the last five to ten years. Um, but it's a different level, right? You're coming from there where you're big fish, small pond, very successful, do a lot of stuff, and all of a sudden you come up to the next level. Uh, did run into some penalty troubles, got suspended. Um, you know, and that, that kind of hampers the, the flow of, of your season. It hampers, um, you know, where you're at, you go from, you know, playing a regular shift and being in, um, uh, being in and out of, you know, special teams. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're out of the lineup for, you know, four or five games. Um, it, it, it does take its toll on, on your flow of the game and where you're at. And you start to kind of question, do I belong there? And you make some decisions and, um, but a couple of factors for him. One, he, he put a ton of time in this summer to really get himself where he needs to be. Uh, he came in with uh, the right frame of mind to be effective from day one. 
Um, and he's basically almost put the team on his back at this point and said, let's go join, join or be gone. Um, and he's got a couple of running mates up there with him that have done it. Uh, obviously this past weekend without Max, uh, an injury, uh, hoping to potentially have him back, uh, this weekend coming up, but, um, that's not a, that's not a guarantee. So, uh, but Jack's been great for us, uh, on and off the ice. And we saw a question on the bottom here. This might be NCDC this week, but we answer all things coach. It's what we do. We got to ask a little about the Florida blades and their start to the season and how we feel about it. Funny enough, we're so good at what we do that we felt like we saw a question coming somewhere in the ether. You can listen in, Luke, and let them know maybe the date when it's coming out. But we have Coach Rosie and the squad there from the Florida Junior Blades coming up on a podcast, Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you can find the Dan K Show. When, when can they listen to that, Lucas Jones? Well, that'll actually be out tomorrow, Dan. And we did anticipate the question because we can actually see the future, folks. And if there, this isn't proof, I don't know what is. So that will be coming out tomorrow. A great interview with the Florida Junior Blades staff on site from the Florida Cup this past weekend. That'll be out tomorrow morning. You'll see that our pass around on socials tomorrow afternoon. But you can listen to it before anyone else if you follow us on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because when you follow, you get that little notification. So be among the first to know what's going on with our audio podcast by following the show. And the secret on the is Spumoni. And you only know that because you're watching here right now. If I say Spumoni, someone wins a prize. I don't know if I do or not. Haven't listened back to it. Potentially I have. I got no well, probably easier than trying to whisper Spumoni into your computer is searching The Dan K Show Presents on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. That's like a like a real version of Spumoni. Kind of. A little bit. Dan, I think if you say the word Spumoni, Lucas has to put on a bow tie next time we do this. Done. That's it. We'll, we'll get Luke. I'm hoping to get a bow tie big enough Spumoni! to fit around. Spumoni! Spumoni! <laughs> If you, I tell you what, if you find a bow tie that fits around my neck, I'll wear it. Hey, you're going to have to wear one soon enough with that wedding coming up. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I don't, I don't know if we're going bow ties, though. If I had my way, we'd be going no ties for the rest of time. But we'll see how that goes. Yeah, you don't have much of a say in that, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Lucas Jones, a man that knows how to a smart move for Lucas. Coach. Before we let you go here, I want to kind of ask you, when we all look at this game of hockey, right, at this Tier 2 level and the Tier 3 level and, and throughout, and a lot of times there's this, this want to kind of abandon ship at this level when there are those tough ups and downs, which the ebbs and flows are going to come in junior hockey. We always say not many people go 44-0, and 52-0. and there's always going to be those ups and downs. Ryan, I will answer that in one second. I got you, baby. You stay right here with me. We got to get Coach Hankel one more question before we let him go. How do you battle through? What do you say as a coach on the bench? And what do you tell the guys maybe watching around the country in different situations that are sitting in a position where they're, they're three and six right now or wherever they're at trying to work back up that ladder, work back up those standings? What, what do we say here, Coach? Um, well, uh, it, it's been a rough two weeks for us. Um, my team can vouch for that. There's a number of them on here, and they're all probably shaking their head in agreement. Um, but for us, it's it's you got to take it one step at a time. Uh, you you got to find the positives in things. Uh, you got to pull in the same direction. Um, I talk about it with our guys about rowing the boat, and everybody's got to row in the same direction. Uh, if you have two or three guys just sitting there with their oar in the water, they're not helping. Uh, they're actually hurting, uh, not just not helping you, but they're hurting you. Um, but it's, you know, you got to kind of go back to basics and, and figure some things out where your deficiencies are, create some building blocks off of those things, and then try to find the positives and everything. And understand that, yes, you still have 43 games to go, but you start to kind of look too far ahead. And then next thing you know, you'll have 23 games to go and not where you want to be. So uh, you got to turn the ship as quick as can, but understand that you're going to probably take three or four steps forward and there's still going to be a step or two back somewhere along the line. Uh, and you just kind of got to refocus and go back to that, the basics and say, okay, let's get back to what made us successful, which is playing hard hockey. Yeah. You can't win tomorrow today, right? You can do the things you need to, to be prepared to win tomorrow today. But you can't do it just yet. We've got to work through each and every day. Coach, 
We're battling with you. I'm looking at the schedule right now. I'm seeing W, a little another W there. I'm seeing two W's back to back. And remember, I'm seeing we can see the future. So, <laughs> dub, you know, maybe you roll through the wagon. I'm seeing, I'm seeing at least six one and zero by the end of this next four game stretch. Uh, listen, last time you said, the <laughs> last time you said that it didn't turn out so well. So, um, Brian, next time we'll Lucas, swimming. Lucas has to say it next time. Maybe it'll come true. Honestly, potentially, because you are 0-1 as a coach in All-Star Games when I am on your Yeah, 100%. 5-0. and Luke, Lucas is the man. He's the white cat. Well, Lucas will put together some selections this weekend. Those will drop on Friday on our social media there. Keep an eye out, folks. Coach Hankel, we got to answer some questions because I'm getting yelled at to answer questions. Uh, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Hey. Um, hey. Thanks for doing this. I really appreciate you promoting us, and I uh, look forward to seeing you guys around the ring. Hey, coach. Coach, we'll see you getting some dubs this weekend. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> my, my hair, my hair is not lasting too well. That's why we're wearing hats now. Ours isn't either. Thanks, guys. See you, coach. Take care. You too, coach. Great time there with Coach Hankel. Now let's get Lucas. Let's take a quick reprieve here. We talked about the cradle of college, the, the development ladder here in the USPHL, in the NCDC, Premier Elite, all the way through. Let's talk Florida Junior Blades real quick, okay? Then we got another question that came in that I want to get to as well from our friend Aaron Preston out there in Carolina. Let's talk first about this Florida Junior Blades team. And for me, again, I think, it, I think you kind of, for Ryan who was asking, we get so stuck on the present, right? I'm looking at where we're at, that we kind of miss out on where we're targeting and where we're going. You look at the performance at the Florida Cup, I don't think this is a bad Florida Junior Blades bunch on either side. I think there's some improvement to be had, and I think you look at some of the net minding you got this past weekend, Lucas, I think this Junior Blades team has every capability to kind of battle back in this Florida division. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that as well, right? I mean, you, you can't always judge what's happening by the numbers on the website right we can look at stats and but we don't really use the stats unless they're backed up by what we see for the most part right we talk to everyone around the league we, we use them as a feeler but i think the big thing for me here is is was seeing them in person this past weekend and I, I liked what i saw i saw a team that was that was really willing to grind right i, I think that's the big thing for me is there a team that's willing to grind they obviously have the the energy the effort they obviously understand what needs to be done. I think they're just running into a lot of really good teams, right? And I think for the Florida Junior Blades right now, that should be, in, I, I think, a point of pride, right? So I think for the Junior Blades, the, the biggest thing for me is to continue to play this, this style of hockey that they're playing so well. You know, you, you'd like to see a little bit more puck control, a little bit more on the defensive end, right? Giving up a lot of shots on net right now, but... Again, Dan, I, I just really liked what I saw at the Florida Cup this past weekend from the Junior Blades. Yeah, I see an R. McLeish in here. Got to be a DJ McLeish relative. One of my favorites in the league right now. A kid that's absolutely tearing it up at the blue line for Idaho Falls. But you look at Florida right now in the standings. They're at six points, right? Three and eight. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to be three and eight at any point at any time. Right. But Atlanta's two points ahead of them with a game in hand. So you win your next game. You're, automat you're already tied for fourth. You need to be in the top four to make the playoffs. All that matters is being in that top four in the Florida division. Top four make the postseason. You don't want to be five. You don't want to be six. You're sitting at five right now. You get those two points. You're tied with Atlanta. No games in hand for them. Bolt City's only six points ahead of you. You know, you're in the mix of this thing. You're in the middle of it. There's no reason to panic. I don't hit the panic button on the Florida Junior Blades one bit. I love that blade side. I was sitting on the ice side there before their game on Saturday night at the Florida Cup. The boys are ready to go. I think it's a locker room that, that's mixed together the right way. I think these guys are getting along. I don't I don't fall asleep on the Florida Junior Blades at all. I expect them to be the fourth seed at the least out of this division. I think right now, if you made me pick, I'd put them at four, Bold City, potentially at three. It's going to come down to two of them on who wants to have that third seed and the fourth seed. But I think those are my four teams that make it through when you had Tampa and the Eels to the bunch. we got another question coming in. What do you guys think? Ogden has to do to remain a top team in the West. That mountain division, I'll tell you what, it we've talked about them already on this one. It helps when you got a guy like Burz Galop between the pipes. The big key out in the mountain division, and I think anybody who's been watching this division when it was a tier three division in the USPHL Premier will understand, is 
everybody beats everybody in this group. And your big deal is going to be, do you take care of business against the guys who are struggling? When the, there's going to be times, these ebbs and flows with these young teams out in the mountain, these are younger teams in this tier two. So you're going to have doldrums. You're going to have a point in the year where the injury bug bites. Do you take care of business at home? Winning record at home for Ogden, they should protect home ice. That crowd should protect home ice. That shouldn't be a problem. A good performance in your three games at the Idaho Falls Spud King Showcase, that should keep them on top. The biggest key is there's nothing in their game they got to change right now. You got Coach Kenny Orlando, which, by the way, that 100th win banner that we shared that Ogden posted, Dang. I will – I will PC this one up, okay, from what I said. But Coach Kenny, oh, baby, looking handsome as all get out in that picture. Come on, Kings supporting Kings. This guy just looking great right now. Kenny, O looking like an absolute stud. You've got Cameron Hollins backing up for Zgalov here. These guys each have four starts apiece. So you've got two netminders that can do it any given night. And Hollins has a 9-1-5 with a 2 7 five. Nothing bad there. Talk about Peyton Struck. My favorite right now. Daniel Ellingson. I think this guy's a, a complete difference maker. Former Squatch player. He's got a bro playing on the Squatch right now. He's tearing it up as well. Lucas is wearing a Squatch shirt. Then you talk about Dimitri Voyatsis with 10 points on the year. He's on a little bit of an assist-getting streak right now, the year 2003. I don't think there's anything that has to change for Ogden. But the big key, if you want to stay on top, you talk about being number one in this division. You thought Utah might, oh, no, they're 0-2. They're going to go away. They'll leave us all alone. Utah's going to come raging back. They're not going anywhere. Lucas will tell you ad nauseum how good he thinks his Provo team is. And with the way Michael Polston's playing in net, good luck with them. I'm right now scrolling through to get to my Ogden schedule before we get to Aaron Preston's question as well here. But you look at it, they got Provo coming up Friday night. And that's a huge game, right? Yep. Like, how do we perform the best? How do we perform against those who are struggling? Sorry about that. My battery's running low, Lucas, so I paused for a second. We're back. Right. How do we perform against the best? How do we perform against the guys who are struggling? You look at that. They're going to have that opportunity back-to-back -back this weekend. They're going to have the Ogden Mustangs against Provo, and then they're going to get the opportunity the very next night against the Rock Springs Grizzlies, both at home. These are the weekends when you want to be number one. These are the weekends you need three out of four points. Four is great, three is good enough, but that's how it's got to go this weekend. Yeah, and I think the three of their next four games are the teams you have to be beating specifically, right? You you have to be Provo. You have to be the one that starts delivering these guys some losses, and they're not going to see Provo again until the end of November and early December. Now, they've got Provo at home, which we talked about how, how Ogden needs to be good at home. They've got that support as well. But earlier in the show, we talked about the resurgence of the Utah outliers a little bit here. I'm buying on this Utah side. So when you, you look at the fact that what does Ogden have to do to stay on top, they got to keep everyone else below them. They're going to have to not just beat the team that's battling with them right now in Provo. They're going to have to potentially go face a Utah team that's got a little bit of a streak behind them, right, that's got momentum. Right, They're catching Pueblo at the beginning of November, November 10th and 11th, both games at home. If Pueblo can build up a little bit of a streak, they're going to have to do that. Right, When you're a top team, you have a target on your back. Other teams might come into your barn feeling like, like world beaters. Yeah. Right, when, when you get beat, it's an accomplishment for another team. So you have to constantly be on the top of your game. So I think for Ogden to stay on top of their division, you, you got to clean up against some specific opponents, but you got to keep weathering that storm night in and night out. 100%. And we had another question come in from Aaron Preston with the Carolina Junior Canes organization down there. And he asked about expansion in the NCDC. Are they going to expand Midwest? Are they going to expand Southeast? And the big answer to that question right now is, you know, it's the group that is in, in control of this organization right now, this league, we – we love working with right you look at you look at commissioner bob toro you look at kevin abrams who's come in from the cchl and has really taken over the operations and the behind the scenes details of this ncdc product as they as they better it as they grow it as this league is trending younger and and the answer is going to be it's if the right situations are there the the eyes will always be open to it and I, and i think that's always my take as well like i'm somebody who has been screaming at the top of my lungs at SEC and ACC schools to get involved at the NCAA Division I level. The funding's there, the money's there, the talent's there. 
anybody who tells you there's too much hockey isn't paying attention to the full rosters everywhere around the country, right? There, there's not too much hockey. There are times where there might be the wrong hockey somewhere, right? You might not be doing it correctly. That I'll agree with you on every time, but there's not too much hockey. Growing a sport takes creating the opportunity. Growing anything creates expanding space, right? If you want more water, you got to have a bigger jug. That's what you have to have. You, you can't, it's not going to hold it in your hands. It's going to disappear. It's going to go away. So creating opportunities to play the game of hockey at a higher level is always great. And I know the people in this league agree with that idea, right? And that's what you're going to look at in the NCDC. If the right opportunities are there, sure. I'm sure they would, right? There's nothing imminent. There's certainly nothing right now, but you look at it. That's always going to be the case. You want your product to be like the idea of the NCDC the idea of the United States Premier Hockey League's elite premier levels are to promote growth of the game. It's to promote opportunity for your players to, pe to play hockey, right? And, and that's the big idea is we want the same thing at every level of the game with what we do as a show. We want everyone. Like, there are more Division I talent level players than there are places to play Division I hockey. 2.3% of the players that play hockey through these levels of the game – get a chance at the NCAA Division I level. And it's not because of ability or lack thereof. It's because of opportunity and lack thereof. And we will continue to push. We will continue to fight for opportunity at the highest levels of this game and throughout so that we can continue to create a model that helps your families, that helps players around the country grow through the ranks of this game and have every opportunity to play at the level that is best for them, that is right for them, and that they can be the best they can be at it. And that's the big thing. Let's go SEC and ACC. Get the money going. Get in Nick Saban's pocket. Maybe instead of 12 and a half mil a year, he can take like 10 and a half and you can build a hockey rink. That'd be great. I'd love it. I'd absolutely love it, Lucas. Now that I've called out Nick Saban on today's broadcast, I think I've done my part. Yeah, I mean it's it's a hundred percent right. And and Aaron, I think you and I were were talking about that at the at the showcase there. And you know, just I think everything that Dan says is is right on the nose. It's it's about opportunity, and you know, if the opportunity is right, you'll see it. But uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is you just keep creating the platform for for players to get involved in the game, right? Whether it's it's guys who are, are picking up the game and and want to want to play, right? High school guys that want to play juniors, or whether it's you know guys who play in youth organizations and move their way up to the 12s, the 14s, the 16s, and start playing elite premier and potentially NCDC, right? It's there's something out there for everybody. So there's a, there's a big umbrella inside the the NCDC and the USPHL. Yeah, we we want to talk. Talk to you all every single day. This we want to answer your questions. We want to be here to talk with you throughout your experience in junior hockey at any level of the game you are playing. Throughout your experience in youth hockey, as you work up to these levels, we are always here as a resource, as a as an opportunity, as a chance to ask the questions you want the answers to. If we don't know the answers, we certainly know the guys and gals around this great sport who do, and we are never afraid to ask questions because I am constantly in a state of confusion. I mean, you, you you pretty much hit it a little bit there again, Dan. And if you if you want to see some some fun stuff coming out of our our past weekends of travel, you can browse the Instagram on the Dan K Show, right? If you're joining us from the NCDC JR Hockey page and you're not following the Dan K Show, go follow them right now. If you're joining us from the Dan K Show page and not following NCDC JR Hockey, go click on that and follow us. The NCDC's got its own social media accounts, so if you want to find out more about NCDC Hockey, that's where you got to go. NCDC JR Hockey. That is it, Dan K and Lucas Jones, your NCDC this week. Be sure to tune in Thursday as well, Premier and Elite fans, where we can answer all your questions in the Elite and Premier levels of this great game. Dan K, Lucas Jones, if you're watching and listening right now, so for some of you guys, you're watching us live. But for some of you, you missed the boat and you're back here and you're listening to us a little bit after the fact on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. For those folks, go subscribe and like that podcast right now so you get updates as to when these new shows come out and we cover all the best the game has to offer. We've got a lot more to come. We're two weeks away from our second NCDC Power Rankings of the Year. This is going to be a fun one. How do you think the ACC and SEC can get to the point you were talking about and maybe some better support for that? That's a big question, Aaron, and usually the answer is money. And Lucas and I, sadly, are not the rich benefactors who can assist in this happening, but it comes down to similar things. Of Look at the University of Penn State. If you had told 10 years ago 
if you had told people that Penn State was going to have an opportunity to play uh, Division One hockey at the NCAA levels, or 15 years ago, I should say, they, they would have told you, no, it's not going to happen. It, there's not a want for it. There's not a need for it. That's always, the, that's always the, the line you'll hear when it comes to anything with investment that the investment's not there or the investment isn't warranted or wanted. And you looked at Penn State, it took a, a wealthy donor to start the ball rolling in a way where the money was tied to the growth of that team. So it'll take some folks that have access to those funds to push their schools, their former schools, or maybe just schools that they support as a fan into those situations. But you look at it, you cannot tell me that the Southeast and, and the, the ACC conferences can't support hockey. The University of Kentucky is playing right now in a barn that is not of NCAA Division One quality, right? And they bring in 2,500 to 3,000 fans a night at midnight for puck drops for their club hockey team. The Louisville Cardinals, Lucas and I have covered them on multiple occasions, over 1,000 a night when they get a big matchup in that building. You look at NC State's outdoor game, the most watched hockey game in college. Like, the it is so possible right now with the correct resources to take 10 to 15 of those schools and create 10 to 15 more chances to play NCAA hockey at the division one level. I am excited to see where hockey goes. You see Tennessee state coming into the fray down there. That's a school with nowhere near the resources of the Tennessee Rocky top folks or the university of Alabama or the university of Kentucky. We're excited to see where this sport can go. I'm telling y'all, if someone's telling you that there's too much hockey, are they a true fan? we got to grow this game as much as we can. You grow the opportunities, you grow more opportunities at a higher level, then you grow the level of play. People can grow to the level they play at. It's why they tell young players, hey, if you're way better than the folks you're playing with in your age range, play up. Start to learn what that next level is doing. Start to play with that crew. Always be challenging yourself, right? And when we create opportunity to challenge ourselves, we create a better player. And over time, we create a better game, a better sport, and a better world for all of you junior hockey fans, college hockey fans, and players, and parents and families nationwide. When Dan Kay is on the mic, it is always hockey night. We thank you for watching NCDC This Week with Dan Kay and Lucas Jones.